Canada just got its first ever independent medical school. Originally a joint initiative between Laurentian and Lakehead universities, it will henceforth be known as the Northern Ontario School of Medicine University, NOSM University for short. It is simultaneously celebrating its 20-year anniversary, educating doctors with patients in the North in mind. Sarita Verma is the Dean, Vice Chancellor, President, and CEO of the school, and she joins us now from Sudbury, Ontario for more. And even before you and I begin this conversation, I got to do two things here in the interests, uh, Madam President, of full disclosure. Number one, I used to be the Chancellor at Laurentian University, with which your institution used to have a relationship. I'm no longer the Chancellor. You no longer have that relationship, but we put that on the record. And also, my wife, who's a health policy consultant, has provided advice to your institution as well. So we put that on the record in the interest of full disclosure as well. A anything else you think I need to disclose while we're at it here, or am I okay so far? Well, only that I have to disclose that I'm a huge fan and have followed the agenda with Steve Pakin for a long time. So, you know, I am a little biased. I don't think that constitutes a conflict of interest or a full disclosure necessity, but thanks for saying it anyway. Uh, okay, to the uh, back on the path here, and that is... Uh, you were once, as we suggested in the introduction, affiliated with two universities, now a standalone institution. How come? Well, you know, when NOSM was created, it didn't have the degree granting authority. It actually was an institution that was a government strategy, a not for profit corporation that had no way legally of granting degrees. The original thought was to actually base NOSM at Laurentian. But the North being as uh, interestingly political and need-oriented, uh, the Northeast and the Northwest came together to collaborate and create a joint degree at Laurentian Lakehead. In February last year, the Laurentian University declared its insolvency. And as a result, NOSM found itself in a fairly precarious financial situation. And as a result, we actually explored many options. But the rapid escalation to becoming Canada's first independent medical university seemed like the most reasonable and the best one. It wasn't an easy journey, but we got there. Well, that's the thing I wanted to figure out. Was it precipitated by the implosion that took place at Laurentian? Yes, it was. And I think that's an important thing to clear up because there was some sense that there were all kinds of uh, plans leading up to this. Listen, I only got here in July 2019. I don't think within six months I would have been able to, even I, if I am a magician, get to that point. <laughs> I would say that the natural history might be that in the course of the next couple of decades it might have achieved that. But the reality was things were pretty stable until Laurentian became insolvent. And what that meant, Steve, was that we were just going through the second only accreditation by the National Committee of our medical doctorate degree, which is the foundation and the cornerstone of our institution. And many of the standards of accreditation look for financial sustainability. Half of our degree was in trouble and we had to look for solutions. We did have the opportunity of looking at other institutions and partnering with them, but you know what? We thought nothing ventured, nothing gained, and we went for the moonshot and we got it. Well, I have to say, you, you got it in really quick time because I've seen in the past, for example, when Ryerson started as a polytechnical institute and wanted to become a university, these things can take years and years and years before the government gives you the green light. Why do you figure you got it so quickly? I think because we're already superb. We had already proven our mettle as a really strong institution, as a positive and a very successful government strategy. And in fact, we have produced physicians in the short 15 years that we've been graduating people, even though we've been around for 20 years, but it takes you know a year to introduce and four years of training before the first class graduates. So we have been producing physicians, over 800 physicians to date, of which if they stay to do their residency, almost 90% of them stay in Northern Ontario. That's number one success. Number two, we're innovative, we're known for social accountability, and we were also leading the world when it came to social accountable medical education. What does that mean, you say? Well, number two success, our physicians are competent and very confident to work in rural remote settings, including First Nations settings. That's a huge success. 
And number three, we produce physicians who are change makers. They aren't there just to graduate and go into their you know, own profession and their own business. They actually are leaders in society. Number three, success. So the government saw that we were already on a very significant trajectory. They escalated it. I'm sure it was pretty fast, but it certainly helps to have been a lawyer trained at the University of Ottawa and a physician trained at McMaster. So those two sides of my brain worked very well to get us to where we are now. I take your point on all of that, but I guess from, I guess what our viewers and listeners really want to know is, is there any difference to the students that you are eventually graduating to become doctors in the North? Is there any difference to them, the fact that you're now an independent institution as opposed to aligned with two others? I think for our students, it's been actually pretty seamless, although they're pretty chuffed and quite excited to have their own Nazem University. We had the chant Nazem U in 22, and the students got quite excited about it. But for their own learning, it's been completely seamless. And in fact, for their degree, they often saw themselves, in fact, all of them saw themselves as graduate of Nazem rather than Laurentian or Lakehead. And their degrees did say Laurentian and Lakehead, but for the purposes of the licensure, et cetera, it usually said Northern Ontario School of Medicine. So we're actually sure that from their perspective, notwithstanding the excitement and the pride that they have, the reality is for their learning, for their education, for their transformative journey to becoming a physician, it was completely seamless. How many new doctors are you going to graduate this spring? Well, this spring, in about a month, I will be attending two convocations, as is the last joint degree, and there will be approximately 60 physicians. We usually have a class of 64, but we have a couple of people on leave. And so 60 physicians will be graduating uh, this uh, spring. And uh, excitingly, we also, the same time we heard we were going to be proclaimed, we also received an expansion of the medical programs. So we'll be adding 30 more positions to our MD program and graduating about 94 plus we have five. So we're going to get close to 100 in the next couple of years. And of course, we're going to be adding 41 positions to our residency programs. Those are the guys who actually have to do training after their MD. And to go into practice, we'll be graduating another 100 over the next few years well, per year. This is the thing I was trying to figure out because, you know, post-secondary institutions all over this province are really having a hard time getting more money out of government these days. There are a lot of priorities, particularly during a global pandemic. And I guess I want to know how you manage to get more money for more spaces at a time when there seems to be so much contraction elsewhere. You know, Steve, the most amazing thing about Northern Ontario, as a Southerner who came here and have experienced the joy, the wonder, and the absolute love that the people have for Nazem is that almost every municipality wrote directory, directly to Premier Ford and advocated. Every city council passed a motion and sent it to the Premier. The voices of Northern Ontario were quite insistent, persistent, and consistent. And they said, expand Nazem. The opportunities for Northerners to get medical education and training in health professions were still limited. We have about 2,000 applications for, at the time, 64 spots, a 3% success rate. By advocating for expansion, the municipalities, the people of Northern Ontario said, we want more. So we almost doubled our MD program and we doubled our residency. This is as a result directly of the people of Northern Ontario and frankly, this government listening to them. Well, I'm going to go back at you on this one again, because when the Liberals were in power, there was a cabinet minister in Sault Ste. Marie, they had cabinet minister in Thunder Bay, they had a cabinet minister in Sudbury. So there was a lot of clout at the cabinet table to advocate for you. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the Conservatives have no seats in Sudbury, they have no seats in Thunder Bay. So why do you think they went ahead with this, even though, you know, at the moment, there's no political gain for them? You know, there are a couple of factors. First of all, I think uh, the, I will say the, the healthcare needs of Northern Ontario are actually pretty compelling. And they've always been that case, particularly in First Nations communities where the social determinants of health are quite uh, challenging. That said, you can't ignore the fact that the pandemic had a significant impact on healthcare. 
we not only face the burnout of healthcare professionals, but a real crisis when it came to the delivery of healthcare, including a crisis of nurses. And uh, the reality is that uh, healthcare in Northern Ontario means that by all indices, chronic disease, mental health and addictions, you know, the opioid crisis is three times worse than it is anywhere else in the province. You just can't ignore it. As we sit here today, Steve, Northern Ontario is short of 326 physicians. That's 120 family physicians right now and well over 180 specialists and subspecialists. We need to increase not only the production of physicians and all healthcare providers, but also recruitment and retention in the North. And if we don't solve these problems, now, the health of the community really severely affects the wealth of the community. And the economy of Northern Ontario is a driver for Ontario. Forestry, mining, and many other areas are actually really important foundational pillars for, North, for Ontario. Hmm. So whether you like it or not, I'm not sure what was driving the government, but you couldn't ignore it. The bathtub was nine-tenths full, and now it's spilling over with need. Gotcha. I know that every other post-secondary institution in the province has been told by the government of Ontario, you have to freeze your tuition again. And this is three straight years that tuition is now being frozen. Were you told to do that as well? Yes, all institutions have a frozen tuition. And how and has that, that affected you? that is a environment. Well, listen, you know, one of the things that Nazem University can do now that we're emancipated is that we can actually re-envision not only the business model, but the value proposition for universities. These are fairly desperate financial institutions, as people will know. Laurentian got into some difficulty, partly because they become addicted to enrollment expansion and to high-cost programs that rely heavily on uh, duration-based degrees. Does society really look for that anymore, or has actually the revolution, particularly the digital revolution in healthcare, changed the way that we do business? So Nazem University, already by all comparators, if you look at the Council of Ontario Fac Finance Officers data, we're actually leaner and more efficient than all other institutions in Ontario, and we intend to set that pace and lead in that regard. Uh, we actually see ourselves as being highly distributed, but with innovative models and a return on investment. Good Lord, a university is going to say return on investment. <laughs> what is the return on investment? Is the number of people you graduate or is it the number of scholarships that you like the amount of scientific discovery that you actually publish? No, those aren't the metrics. The metrics are when those people graduate, do they get jobs? Do they go into areas where they make a difference? Do they lead society? Does the scholarship actually make change? Do the publications and research actually lead to curing disease? Those are the things that Nazem University aspires to do. We aspire to transform health education and lead in that regard. And I'm not being Pollyanna. I actually believe it can be done. Today, for example, in your business, Steve, People used to be able to, to do long-form journalistic articles and do deep research and create several pages for a newspaper. Now we're training journalists to get small bits of information and post it on social media. That's the transformation we need to go from duration-based degrees to actually just-in-time learning, and not just-in-case learning, but just-in-time learning and right in, not just learning anywhere, but learning everywhere. No, I get you. And part of that transformation of the post-secondary system in this province has been we're taking far more foreign students than ever before, in part because thankfully they want to come here, and in part because they pay a lot more tuition than somebody who's born and raised in the province of Ontario. So I guess I want to know from you whether foreign students are making up an increasingly large part of your student body as well. No, not at all. We, are, we exist for Northern Ontario. And our goal will be to continue to recruit from Northern Ontario. 90% of our students come from Northern Ontario. Our 
primary mandate is to meet the healthcare research and education needs of Northern Ontario. And as much as that would be uh, relatively interesting for us, our partnerships might be in graduate educations, but not in the MD program. And certainly in our residencies, we'd be looking to increase the opportunities for international medical graduates who are Canadian citizens and permanent residents who are here in Canada who would like to access uh, licensure in uh, health professions in Canada. Those are things that we would like to be able to explore with the government and with policy to change. But in terms of foreign students, other than graduate programs, we're not looking to expand in that area. That's um, an ethical discussion as well. You know, what is the purpose of those uh, programs and is it revenue generation or is it high quality uh, you know, education for other countries that returns those graduates to those countries. Those are big ethical discussions that we have yet to have. Indeed. All right, let's talk about, I really want to get a better sense about how the rubber hits the road in Northern Ontario in terms of the numbers of doctors you're able to send into the community and what impact they're able to have. And I'll just give you a little personal anecdote from my own experience here. You know, my mother-in-law, when she was alive, lived in Sudbury, Ontario, and always had trouble getting in to see her GP. That was just the reality. There, there are a shortage of doctors everywhere, particularly Northern Ontario, and I know you're trying to graduate more docs into the community who can alleviate that backlog. The question is, is it really happening? Is it easier to get to see a doctor in the North today as a result of Nossum being there for 20 years? I think in some places it is, Steve. In Sudbury, for sure, there are uh, well over 70 doctors here that weren't here before. And the same in Thunder Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, Timmins, North Bay. But in the smaller rural communities, that's not the case. We have a lot more work to do. And, uh, you know, many communities, such as you may have heard, Red Lake, are in crisis. Uh, Red Lake, Thessalon, Sioux Lookout, they've had to close emergency rooms. Uh, there are places where you can't see a doctor. You can't access health care unless you travel for many hours. That's uh, precarious for people who are in uh, health crisis. So we have a lot more work to do. We are introducing some new ideas. We're building a rural generalist pathway that actually helps people come out of rural communities and go back to rural communities. We have not been successful in graduating, although we've graduated well over 50 self-identified Indigenous physicians, we have not been successful in getting them into First Nations communities. So as I said, our work here has only just begun. It takes more than you know 15 years of graduates and 20 years being in place to get it done. But frankly, becoming our own independent university gives us that flexibility. Prior to this, we would have been relatively locked down in Sudbury and Thunder Bay, but now we plan to be regionalized and pan-Northern. Can I just follow up on that thing you just said about graduating First Nations physicians, but being unsuccessful in getting them into their own communities? What does that mean? Well, I think one of the challenges is that the medical institution is only half of the job. Half of the job is educating people, preparing them for practice, and then once they graduate, they're free agents and where they go to practice and what their practice remuneration models are like, what the practice environment is like, what the hospitals offer them, what the communities offer them in terms of schooling, housing, jobs for their families, etc. Uh, those are all elements that we don't have much control over. And if I was to say anything to Northern Ontario or to those communities that are in desperate need of physicians or nurse practitioners or health providers is this. You need to do your part of the bargain, which is you need to create an environment in which people want to come live there and work there. And part of that involves actually providing them with the infrastructure they need. Employers need to make it attractive for people who want to come and buy houses, uh, settle in those communities and actually provide jobs for their trailing spouses. Those are things that Nazem University advocates for but doesn't have much control over. Also this, the models of remuneration for rural remote Ontario are really in need of a major overhaul. The government and the latest physician services agreement did recognize elements of that with the uh, what's called the RNPGA model. But listen, what your, what your viewers want to know is this, why would somebody want to come and practice in Northern Ontario? Well, frankly, 
it's less expensive, the lifestyle is fantastic, and the working environment is really superb, unparalleled, but it's tough. It's a really hard environment. You can often be isolated, so it takes a unique personal per personality. That's the person that we're recruiting to Nazem University, and give us some time. We'll be successful. Well, let me follow up on that angle because uh, I, I don't know whether you've had a chance to follow up with any of your graduates during the course of COVID, but I wonder how many have said to you, holy smokes, I can't, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm on the verge of burning out. I just never thought it would be this tough. Do you know how many people you've lost who have just decided to throw in the towel because, you know, when it's happening south of the French River too, of course, there's lots of burnout going on out there among medical professionals. What are you hearing? I'm hearing that it's actually much worse in Northern Ontario because of the isolation and because of the fact that uh, often you're the only physician or one of three physicians. One of you might actually have tested positive for COVID. One of you is coming off being on call for 48 hours and you're going on call and you are it in this small emergency room in Wawa. You're the obstetrician, you're the critical care doctor, you're the emergency doctor and you're the surgical assist or you're the you know, person who's actually doing the surgery and you've got a room full of people who need to be cared for. So yes, um, I would say we're predicting a significant burnout and a big physician retirement as a result of pandemic induced uh, exhaustion. And to be honest, it's also pretty hard to be in a profession which has become one of the most dangerous professions in the world right? Your, your, your risk of, uh, of getting COVID and potentially getting it very badly and significantly is high. And the fear factor, you know, COVID anxiety is not uh, an uh, insignificant issue. So the, the general data in, in uh, Canada shows that 42%, maybe even up to 50% of physicians are currently burnt out. In Northern Ontario, one of our studies, it wasn't recent in the last couple of years, but certainly, you know, in, just as the pandemic was coming on, showed us that 50% of our doctors would retire in the next five years. Might be worse as a result of the pandemic. So, hey, we've got to get going with our job. <laughs> well, speaking of getting going, we got to get going too, but I do have one last question in our last 30 seconds, and that is, how long do you plan to stay on the job, and what do you want to make sure happens before you leave it? Well, you know, when I came here, my uh, unanticipated, of course, didn't think uh, within six months there would be a pandemic and within seven months there would be an insolvency of half of our degree program. So, uh, number one, uh, rescue the institution and make it into a university. Check. <laughs> number two, expand the medical school positions so that we can expand accessibility for Northerners to higher education and to medical education. Check. Number three, uh, attain financial sustainability for the institution. Uh, I would say I'm in the middle of getting there. We're negotiating with government, but we're also negotiating with Laurentian and Lakehead. They jointly hold about $30 million of our endowments, and those are intended for Nazem University students. We'd like that back, please. <laughs> and we'd like to raise money. Uh, if anyone's listening and they're prepared to give us an opportunity to support us, uh, we would be very interested in a large endowment to make us, essentially, we aspire to be tuition free for our students. Our students are not coming from rich families. So yes, raising money, getting there, not quite a check. And then finally, uh, my first term ends in two years and I am, uh, Really excited. I've fallen in love with Northern Ontario. So my goal would be to establish sustainable succession planning to make sure that Northerners for Northerners and actually the sustainability of Northern education and research leads us into becoming the most powerful consortium in Ontario for education. So if there is a Jane Doe listening who's got 50 million bucks burning a hole in her pocket, you're happy to name the school after her if she gives you that money? Listen, I mean, the University of Toronto changed their name to Temerity Faculty of Medicine, I think for the right value proposition. But listen, it's not about me and it's not about the institution. It's about the kids. We have kids whose debt load is three times more than it is in any other person. They don't come from rich families. They come from Northern Ontario with the average income of $80,000 per year. And they have to have a significant, their debt is close to a quarter of a million. 
If we can actually help these kids and make sure that we balance out and flatten the socioeconomic status of people coming into medicine, I would be delighted to talk to anybody who'd like to approach us. Please <laughs> they, do. They know where to find you. That's Sarita Verma, President, Vice Chancellor, Dean, CEO of the Northern Ontario School of Medicine University, Nossum University, as it's now called. Thanks for joining us on the agenda tonight. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.